Good afternoon, colleagues. Maybe there's learners also watching the video. I hope that we can help you today with some of exam tips and quick wins. We uh, accumulated a lot of marks. So if we look at grade 12, paper 2, the content is the, the code of um, life, meiosis, genetics, and then the one of evolution. But let us look at how can we break it down for you and give some crucial information and tips on these topics. The first thing that is very important when we look at um, the code of life is DNA replication versus transcription. So sometimes straightforward answer in the exams, but the way we are going to answer it, that is a problem when we start marking. So I highlight it. The DNA double helix molecule unwinds. We cannot only state the molecule unwinds or the DNA unwinds, it must be the DNA double helix unwinds. Also, we must say each strand serves as a template and not just the DNA surface, a template, you must say each strand. And then we must indicate that it's free DNA nucleotides that um, will form a complementary base. So the difference between DNA replication and transcription also very important. So always one of these will be asked in the exam. So the one is the deep double DNA helix unwinds and one strand is used or, or each strand is served as a template. In this case, in transcription, it is one strand. In DNA, it's DNA nucleotides that we are using to form a DNA um, replica. And in transcription, we use the RNA molecule to do that. And in DNA, the, the, the product is two genetically identical DNA molecules. And in RNA, the product is a mRNA complementary to the DNA, and that is the product. So maybe they can ask it to explain, or they can ask the difference. So emphasize on how to explain. We need um, those highlight marks. In translation, it is very important to look in translation. The anticodon of the tRNA matches the codon on the mRNA, but if they ask you a specific um, example, then you must say the anticodon of the tRNA, and maybe you have to mention the anticodon. Maybe it is GCC will matches the codon on the mRNA, and that will be C. Um, TT. So look at what they ask and bring the required amino acid. Maybe they refer to a specific acid, then you must name. So now you must not take your knowledge on translation and you must be able to apply it on a specific example. Code of life, it's very important to know your diagrams. So you have to um, identify that V is the mRNA. U is the anticodon, T is the tRNA, S is the amino acid there. And a lot of amino acids that binds together is called a polypeptide. And the ribosome, you must be able to identify the ribosome. And you must be able to uh, apply your knowledge that in the ribosome, the process of translation is taking place. Also, the... Um, binding between two amino acids, and that binding is called a peptide binding. Then they ask always something like, they like give a table, and they indicate the amino acids. You don't know, have to know the amino acids, but in this case, the table below represents DNA. So therefore, the red around DNA, and the DNA base triplet, this is the DNA base triplet. Sometimes they will say this is mRNA. Then they will ask it, you must determine the DNA. So look what is the table. What is the heading of the table? DNA or RNA or mRNA. So that is very important. So give the DNA base triplet of his. So you will go to his and then the base triplet is GTG. Or they will ask the codon of his. Then they refer to the mRNA of yeast. So if, if we go to yeast, 
Then we will see GTG is a DNA, so the codon will be CAC. So be careful, read carefully, read very carefully on what they ask, and also they can ask give the nitrogen base of G. For example, that is guanine or T, that is thymine. So also know your different um, nitrogen bases and the um, letters. Right, so if I look at DNA and RNA, that is the um, differences between DNA and RNA. Again, you have to read very carefully. If they ask what is the differences between DNA and RNA, we can, you can mention any of these. But if they ask what is the differences in the nucleotide base, or what is the differences in nucleotide of DNA, then we only can refer to the nitrogen base is thymine, and the nitrogen base is uracil, and contains deoxyriboses, and the RNA, uh, and RNA contains riboses. So read carefully, what do they ask? Do they ask the differences, or do they ask the differences in nitrogen bases? A typical question again, I can give you a, a sequence of a protein and a sequence of amino acids that is binding there. And now they can ask, for example, what is number one? Um, what is the DNA base triplet of valine or vol? So I go to vol and I can see on my table, I can read it of CAC. So just read carefully, what do they ask? Do they ask? the base triplets, or do they ask the mRNA or the tRNA, do they ask amino acid number three, or do they ask amino acid number seven? All right. So in this case, we see that there is important um, mutation that did take place at number six, and now usually they will ask, explain the mutation. What happens now? So. First of all, you must indicate where the mutation is um, did occur. So, what is the change in the sequence of the DNA base triplet? So, that is a mutation, and specifically a gene mutation. So, you will indicate the position, position number six, and then you will indicate that glutamine or GLU was replaced with VIL, and you explain how this mutation did take place. So the CAS on the VAL changed to GAG on the mRNA and therefore a new amino acid was formed. So specifically refer to the different codons and anticodons that was formed when they ask, explain the mutation. Sometimes there is a mutation, but then the mutation, the new um, codon or anticodon will also um, code for the same amino acid. So there is a, a, a mutation, but there's no change in the amino acid, so there's no change in the protein, so be very careful, look and read very carefully if the mutation does bring a new amino acid or does it change the protein. But we must explain mutation according to the DNA that changed, and then the mRNA that changed, and then the tRNA that changed. All right. Something that is very, very, very important is the DNA profiling and how to determine the father. Now, in this case, remember, any baby must have either a DNA profile band from the mother, or a DNA profile band from a father. So the DNA profile of a baby or a child must compare with either the mother or either a father. So how do we do this? The first step what we do is we compare the baby and the mother because we know who is the mother, ne? because she gives birth. When we determine who is the mother's um, DNA profile bands, we eliminate them, then the rest of the bands must compare with one, all the bands must compare with one of the males. So in this case, we can definitely see as the, on the screen that male 
to is definitely the father. So, who is the father? Male two. Now they want you to explain your answer, and then the, the explanation must be the remaining bands that does not match with the mother. All of them matches with the father uh, or the male two, and therefore male two is the father. Another thing that I want to emphasize here, I'm not saying that the baby's DNA matches the father's DNA. I'm, I'm saying, or my statement will be, the baby's DNA profile bands matches the DNA profile bands of the male. So we are in a hurry, and then you write, the DNA of the baby matches, most of the DNA of the baby matches most of the DNA of the father. And that is totally wrong. It's not the DNA that matches, it's the DNA profile bands that matches. So the DNA profile bands of the baby matches the DNA profile bands of the father. And if it's uh, uh, about suspects and um, DNA that was found in a glass or something, then we will say the DNA profile bands of the glass, or which was found on the glass, matches the DNA profile bands of suspect 1. So we refer to this as DNA profile bands. Make sure that you do that, otherwise it's not great. So in, in this case, we don't say more DNA profile bands, um, band matches male 2, we must specifically mention that the remaining DNA profile bands matches male 2. Meiosis, please um, look at um, the different stages and you must be able to identify these stages and also you must um, explain what is the behavior of the chromosomes during these phases. So I just want to emphasize one thing. In metaphase 1, we refer to homologous chromosomes on the metaphase, on the equator. So in metaphase 1, it is homologous chromosomes. And in anaphase, it is chromosome pairs that separated or chromatids that separate. So in metaphase 1, it's homologous chromosomes. In metaphase 2, it's only chromosomes that are in, on the equator, like this one. In this case, there's only chromosomes on the equator. It's not homologous chromosomes, so therefore, this will be metaphase 2. Furthermore, you must be able to identify the central, the spindles, the centromere, and the um, phase that is represented here and also you must be able to um, explain the function of the centriole and the spindle fibers and the centromere in metaphase. Then in metaphase as I said um, in meiosis you must be able to identify the different phases if I can quickly show you there. So in metaphase 1, we have homologous chromosomes that are on the equator, but in this case we have only chromosomes that are on the equator. So that is a very important um, word that we must use, homologous. In this, in this picture, the first picture, a chromosome is separated to the sensual, and in this case a chromatid. So this is anaphase 2. But where we have a whole chromosome, it's anaphase 1. So be very careful to look at that in your explanation. We must not forget about non-disjunction, where on chromosome pair 21, homologous chromosomes um, fail to separate. So we, I mentioned the pair that doesn't separate, and I mentioned that it's homologous chromosomes that doesn't separate. Chromosomes, sister chromatids, daughter chromosomes. So this is a chromosome. It binds together by a centri centromere, which binds uh, two chromatids. And we call this chromatid sister chromatids. So, and in anaphase, we start to form a daughter chromosome. So this is not a chromatid. After they separate, they 
it forms a daughter chromosome. So be careful when you are talking to of a chromatid and when you are talking to a daughter chromosome. Be be careful for that. Please pay attention to the differences between meiosis and mitosis. Remember meiosis introducing um, genetic variation and mitosis is just an exact um, copy of the um, chromosomes. So the differences between meiosis and mitosis, meiosis is two cell division, mitosis is one cell division, etc. So please look at your differences. Long time ago that they asked a question on tabulated differences or mentioned the differences. Also in the differences of meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Make sure that you know what is the differences between them in each, in each phase. The pro phase, remember in meiosis 2 there is no crossing over. And in meiosis 1 it's homologous pairs. And in meiosis 2 it's only chromosome, as I mentioned before. Then the importance of meiosis, it introduced um, genetic variation and it also has a, a, a halving effect of, of meiosis to overcome the doubling effect of fertilization. So there's three very important for meiosis. What is the importance of meiosis? Also a long time they didn't um, ask that, so therefore I want us to emphasize on the importance of meiosis. Something that I just want to look at is um, crossing over the, the, um, pre, the state, how you were going to state it or how you are going to write it. Remember, it occurs during prophase 1, that is important. Then we have to say homologous chromosomes. We cannot say chromosomes exchange um, genetic material. Sometimes you say it's prophase 1, chromosomes exchange genetic material. And you leave out the fine detail of the process. So it's homologous chromosomes. And when they are lying together, it is usually the non-sister chromatids that overlap. Not chromatids, not any chromatid overlap during crossing over. It is the non-sister chromatids of a homologous chromosome pair. Or the adjacent chromatids overlap. They exchange genetic um, material and then, very important, the product of crossing over is a combination of gen genetic material from both parents or two genetically different chromosomes. In this case two, but actually genetically different chromosomes is the end product of provice. So in random arrangement, um, also, in random arrangement, we have to say the homologous chromosomes arrange randomly on the equator during metaphase 1 and the single chromosome arrange randomly on the equator during metaphase 2. So again, in metaf metaphase 1, we have homologous chromosomes and not chromosomes alone. So there's a big difference between the homologous chromosomes and chromosomes of metaphase 1 and two, and you must emphasize on that one and make a differentiation between metaphase one and two. So that is contribution to variation, which is very important. Also, when I look at mutations, you must be able to differentiate between a gene mutation and a chromosomal mutation. So a gene mutation is a change in the sequence of the nitrogen basis of the DNA. So that whole sentence will allocate uh, two marks or zero marks. Chromosome mutation is the number and the structure of the chromosomes. Random fertilization, um, where any sperm can fertilize any egg. Random mating, any male can mate with any female. So that is um, very, very important to look at. And the way we answer it, Sometimes you know what, what, what is the answer, but there's a difficulty in expressing yourself when you are answering these um, questions. If we look at genetics, genetics is, uh, is, is very important that you read. Um, genetics is like mathematics. There's a formula that you must use and apply when you are doing uh, genetics. So... Um, Let's focus just on a few points 
we um, sometimes you 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 struggle to identify what the plus, um, the answer is. Now there's a relationship between the chromosomes, the DNA, the gene, and the genome. So the gene is a small portion of the DNA that codes for a characteristic. So there's a gene that codes for a characteristic. DNA, on the other hand, um, codes for uh, all your characteristics. I'm going to say that again. A gene is for only coded for one characteristic, and DNA codes for all your characteristics. So that's the difference between a gene and the DNA molecule. Then the other one that is problematic is the, uh, a genome versus a karyotype. A genome <coughs> is the mapping of all your genes on all your chromosomes. That is the, that is the genome. And a karyotype is the number and shape, the arrangement of the number and shape of all your chromosomes. So listen carefully, a genome is all your genes on all your chromosomes, and that is the human genome. But a karyotype refers to the number and shape of your chromatids. The number and shape uh, of your chromosomes, and in this case that is called a karyotype, and we can make a lot of um, conclusions with a karyotype, we will come to that. So very important, the difference between a genome, all your genes. If you have that word in your, um, give one word uh, the biological term, then you, you must know all your genes is a genome. Then do not forget about multiple alleles. Remember now, multiple alleles is um, two alternative forms of a gene at the same locus. So there's two alternative forms. We know that the alternative form is an allele. So in multiple alleles it means there are two or more. No, I said it wrong there. So if there are more than two, not two and more, there are more than two alleles at a specific locus. In this case, with blood groups, we have um, three alleles. We have the allele um, capital letter A, we have the allele capital letter B, and we have the allele small letter I. So that is your three alleles. And these three alleles can code, code for four different phenotypes. Therefore, we have blood group A, B, blood group A, B, that is codominance, and blood group O, that is a complete of um, complete dominance. So remember now, multiple alleles are more than two alternative forms of a gene at the same locus. And the um, example that you have to know is blood groups. So they can ask you explain multiple alleles using blood groups, and then you can say these three are alleles. That goes for four phenotypes of um, blood groups. Also in blood groups, I can um, ask you to explain uh, Mendel's law of dominance using blood groups, and then you can explain complete dominance, you can explain um, co-dominance, and also you can explain that the recessive allele is only expressed um, if it is in the genotype homozygous. And then we can use blood group O for that to explain that. So blood groups, very, very, very important. The way we are writing blood groups, um, the alleles of blood groups, and how blood groups express dominance, also co-dominance, and also how blood groups um, is a good example of multiple alleles. As I stated before, we look at the karyotap type. It is the number and um, shape of homologous chromosomes on, uh, that is displayed. And we can see in this case, we have homologous chromosome P, there it is. We can see that this one, autosomes, is from number 1 to 22, and then the gonosome is number 23. And I just want to emphasize something on the gonosome. When we refer to this, 
we say this is an example of a male, we, uh, and the reason why it's not, um, it has an X and a Y chromosome. We have to specifically refer refers to um, the gonosome or chromosome pair 23 that have a X chromosome and a Y chromosome. It doesn't have an X and a Y. We didn't. We we are not busy with math. It have an X and a Y chromosome on chromosome pair 23 or on the gonosome. So sometimes we will ask what is the um, gender of this karyotype and then they will say male and the reason is they have an X and Y chromosome. So we must just be specific with that X and Y chromosome always and don't write just X and Y. So very important there. Always important if this is a, is this a normal um, human karyotype or, or is it a, um, Down syndrome? How many chromosomes in the gamete? How many chromosomes in a body cell? So make sure that you know the difference between um, gametes and gametes is haploid and body cells are diploid or somatic cells are diploid. So make sure that you know how many gametes, how many chromosomes will there be in a gamete. And how will this person's gamut, um, for example, differ in chromosome number? Very important. Then people, if we look at um, monohybrid crossings, the only thing f at this stage, a monohybrid crossing is uh, answer very good. Um, we must look at um, what, uh, where we allocate the marks. The marks are allocated um, in, in that different stages. And if we look at these different stages, we will see um, we must indicate P1 and F1 on the right position. P1 is on top, F1 is on the bottom. So in this case, we have tongue rollers and non-tongue rollers. Sometimes they use um, flowers. We cannot say pink and, oh, for, for example, red crosses with white. We must say a red flower crosses with a white flower. That is very important when we use um, the diabric crossing. So look at the allocation of marks and then the position of meiosis and fertilization also very important. It must be on the right position for one mark to be allocated in that situation. So then um, I just want to emphasize something on diabric crossings. Diabric crossing is, is where we have two genes that are cross um, we have, in this case, a gene that is um, plant height and a gene that is term color. And the, these two genes have alleles. So for plant height, we have a tall plant and a short plant. In term color, we have a black and a red. So listen very quickly for what I'm asking. So if I ask what is the two genes that we are crossing here, it will be stem color and plant height. If I ask you, um, what is the dominant phenotype? The dominant phenotype for, a, for plant height, so the dominant phenotype for plant height is tall. What is the dominant allele for plant height? It's only the letter T. So read very careful. If I ask phenotype, you give the phenotype, the tall or the black or the red. If I, fr if I ask allele, then you must look at the capital letter T or capital letter B or small letter B. So what is the recessive phenotype for stem color? It will be red. But what is the recessive allele for stem color? It will be small letter B. So read very carefully what they are asking um, in a diabetic crossing. You don't have to do, be able to do a diabetic crossing, but I can give you a diabetic crossing like in this example, and I can ask you to write down the gametes of um, one, or write down the genotype of two, etc. So read carefully what they ask in a dihybrid crossing. The types of dominance is very, very important in genetics. Either you have to give 
the biological term or maybe you must we give you the biological term we say it is co-dominance and now you have to explain it so um, also in this case you must make a definition part of your example so the, the definition of complete dominance is one allele is dominant and the other one is recessive in such a way that the recessive allele is masked by the dominant allele and then you have to add in the heterozygous position because that is the new definition in our exam guidelines. So let us see if we ask, maybe they will ask um, what type of dominance is illustrated in this picture. So we will say complete dominance, explain your answer and then we will say um, one allele, the red allele is dominant over the white allele or it masks the white allele. Therefore, all the flowers will be red um, in a heterozygous condition. So when you take the definition and you apply it to the example. The same with co-dominance. Remember now both alleles of the gene are equally dominant and both alleles are expressed. So what happens in the exam, maybe you have stage fright of exam jitters or whatever, and then you say both alleles are um, equally dominant and are both are equally expressed in the phenotype. They are not equally expressed in the phenotype. They are both alleles are expressed in the phenotype in a heterozygous condition. That means if the genotype is heterozygous, it will be expressed. So both alleles of the gene are equal dominant. So at co-dominance, they are equal dominant and they are both expressed in a heterozygous condition. But if we look in um, incomplete dominance, neither one of the two alleles of a gene is dominant. Not one of the um, two alleles is dominant over the other one. And then, very important, we have an intermediate phenotype in the heterozygous condition. So, make sure that you know exactly how the definition is stated and know that you can explain it in example. So, in this, side, in this one, we will say neither one of the two alleles, red and white, um, is dominant over one another. It results in a I think it's pink intermediate phenotype in the heterozygous condition. So that is very, very important to look at your um, different dominance, types of dominance. Then in short is the um, Mendel's laws, the law of dominance. I was already say you can, said that you must look at um, the example of blood. Mendel's principle of segregation, make sure that you know what is the definition and Mendel's principle of independent assortment and also know what is that. So um, Mendel's principle of segregation in, in mono-hybrid crossings we will have that no two alleles will be uh, during meiosis go into the same gamut so alleles will separate. So make just sure, for, especially your level 7 learners um, struggle with this when we ask it in the exam. So make sure that you know your definition and that you can apply your definition to an example. In this case, I just want to emphasize something. Uh, the way we are writing a dominant allele and a recessive allele, we must use the capital letter and the small letter. Um, we can't write capital letter A and then a capital letter A but just smaller and think um, that is representing the recessive allele. The recessive allele is represented by a small letter. So in this case it will be wrong if we use capital letter A and just a smaller capital letter A. So the way we are writing the dominant allele and the recessive allele, use the letters that I give you and use it as the way we are writing it as a capital letter and as a small letter. Um, how sex is determined in humans? Normally this is a straightforward question, but, um, and it counts six marks, but when you start marking it, 
um, then learners struggle because the way they are answering. So we will say learners will write female have an X and an X and male have an X and a Y. If the X fuses with the X, it's, uh, the offspring is a female with XX. So that is zero marks because we must say females have only gonosomes, uh, two X chromosomes, and males have on the gonosome a X and a Y chromosome. Please leave out a B chromosome and small chromosome. We're not talking about that anymore. It's an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. So if the X chromosome of the female fuses with the X chromosome of the male, then the offspring will have two X chromosome on the gonosome, which results in a female. So I know you, you know this, but the way you will express yourself, that is something else. So I just emphasize on X chromosome on the gonosome, and it's not the XX and the XY. So please look at that. Then if I look at pedigree diagrams, your pedigree diagrams is something that you must um, practice a lot, but let us see if they ask a pedigree diagram on um, sex link. So they indicate to us Hunter syndrome, um, the males are the black ones and the unaffected ones is um, white. And the square is males and the circles is females. They don't have to give us a key, it's not necessary, so they can leave out the key. And then we must know that squares represented males and circles represented um, female. In this case, we can go and um, allocate it, the gene type of each individual because we can now know that John is Hunter syndrome male um, and um, in the opening statement I will tell you which symbol to use. So if they have Hunter syndrome, then it means to have a recessive allele because sex links are a recessive allele that is carried on the X chromosome. So it's very important to know your definition of a sex link disease. So in this case, it's very easy to, to, to um, allocate the genotypes of the males. So lucky is also not so lucky. He have a recessive allele on the X chromosome, therefore he has Hunter's syndrome. But now it comes to ethyl. So ethyl is unaffected female. So in fact, she can have um, two types of genotypes. She can either be um, capital letter T, capital le uh, small letter T, or she can have capital letter T, capital letter T, but the reason why we allocate um, the small letter T with ethyl is the Y chromosome from John is carried to Lucky because Lucky is a boy, so the father gives him the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome of his chromosome goes to Lucky. And the X chromosome Lucky inherits from its mother. And in this case, because he's Hunter syndrome, he inherited from his mother, so his mother is a carrier, although she's not affected, she's a carrier of this syndrome and therefore Lucky inherited the X chromosome that carries this um, Hunter syndrome, um, inherited from his mother. So therefore we can establish that ethyl is heterozygous for Hunter syndrome, so she's a carrier. So make sure that you definitely know how to write um, sex link um, genotypes, if it's a male or a female. And the female will only be um, affected if it, she has a homozygous condition. And that brings me at another one. You must go and look at sex links disorder. Why females have a smaller chance of suffering from hemophilia or any other sex link disorder and the other one that they ask is why are there more males that have color blindness or any other sex link disorder so it's all about 
females that have two X chromosomes. So if they have the recessive allele on one of the X chromosomes, they have another X chromosome that can mask the other one. And with males, they only have one X chromosome that can carry a recessive allele. So if they have the recessive allele, the, the chances is 100% that they can have sex-linked sex disorder. So please look at this. It's, it's popular questions. It's usually it is there in the question paper, um, especially when there are sex links disorders. Then people brief um, outline of the process of cloning. You must understand it and you must be able to apply the knowledge. So in short, when we re remove a nucleus, Usually the nucleus is diploid and we don't want that characteristic. That is why we remove it. When we insert a nucleus, then we need that characteristic and the nucleus is usually um, diploid. And why doesn't the offspring look like the surrogate? Because the offspring have the whole set of diploid chromosomes from the donor who donate um, a diploid Nucleus. So make sure that you know your cloning and why do we remove it and why do we insert a memory cell because it's diploid and we need that characteristics. The same with biotechnology. Make sure that how do we use bacteria um, to produce insulin or produce any other medicine. Um, we use the plasmid, we take the desired gene, we place it in the plasmid, the plasmid is now recombinated, we place the plasmid back into the bacteria, we allow the bacteria cell to reproduce by mitosis because it's a very uh, it's a quick process and many bacteria cells can be formed and then we extract, uh, in this case, the insulin or whatever we need. So make sure of um, cloning and biotechnology. Um, it's things that we skipped um, in classes. They are not much evaluated over the past years, especially uh, biotechnology. So go and look on questions how they ask you to use biotechnology. Um, cloning and biotechnology for genetics is very, very important. The other thing of genetics is when we have to explain the, the disadvantages of, of cloning uh, or genetic engineering, either cloning or biotechnology. Um, look at your disadvantages and your advantages and make sure that you can apply it for in, in, in a, a exam. So in this case, this advantage is expensive. It will very, be very expensive to buy a fish banana or banana fish or whatever this thing is. Um, it interferes with nature. Nature, it's not normal. I don't know if that's normal. And we don't know the health impacts, uh, impacts and the uh, long-term effects. It's all there, but apply it on a example. That is very, very important. People, um, I quickly want to refer to natural selection and the new way we must answer natural selection. And if you did natural selection in class, you will follow it um, uh, with me. In the past, we, we stated natural selection. There's variation. Um, we have long necks and short necks. Long necks um, are favorable characteristics. Um, they survive, short neck is um, uh, unfavorable characteristics, they die out. But now um, the, the approach is a little bit different and more scientifically correct. If we explain natural selection, the, we state the characteristics that varies. In this case, then we will state the first um, statement will be there's a variation in the length of giraffe necks. Not again, there's a variation in giraffes. So specifically, what is the variation? In this case, the variation is the length of giraffes. Next. Then describe the variation. Then we will say there is giraffes with a long neck, and then there's a giraffe with a short neck. The third one that is also new, now you must state the selective pressure. And what is what, which one will be favorable? So when 
we eat leaves or food was only available on top of the trees or on higher trees, natural selection took place between giraffes with long necks and short necks. So if it was um, dark colored and white colored mouse, then we will say um, the selective pressure was that the owl in the night can only see the white man uh, or was hunting in the night and therefore there was a um, this natural selection between white mouses and dark mouses. So please we we must um, state the characteristics that varies then we name the variation then we must say what is this natural selection Wh which force is going to select and now we state the um, unfavorable characteristic and why is it unfavorable. We can no longer say short necks was unfavorable, they die. We must explain, we must elaborate and say short necks was unfavorable characteristic, they couldn't eat enough food, they haven't got long necks to eat the f uh, leaves on the top, so they die of hunger. And then we state the favorable characteristics. We say the giraffe with the long neck have a favorable characteristic. He could eat more, he could survive. So when he eat more, he survive. And then what happens? We will say that this characteristic of having a long neck survive, these giraffes reproduce and they reproduce um, offsprings with the desirable characteristic which is long necks. So just a, a fine tuning on how to answer it. Not anymore, there's a variation, favorable and unfavorable characteristics, long necks is favorable, they survive, short necks unfavorable, so we must elaborate in our answers and that is very very important especially with natural selection. So the next one I want to jump to is speciation. The same with speciation, we must apply speciation onto an example and um, as it is stated in the exam guidelines. If a population of a single species, now mention the original species in the exact um, that they refer to. So we will say, if the population of um, single rabbits or single tortoises are separated and then we will mention the specific barrier river mountain lake they won't give a mark if you say become separated by a geographical barrier and you don't mention the barrier then we go to the normal then we say um, the population is split into mention how many um, islands or populations they are split into they are split into uh, the original populations was split into three or four populations. Um, there were no gene flow. Since the population may be exposed to different environmental conditions, um, that, um, that will be different. And you mentioned that there is natural selection independently and they differ genotypically and phenotypically. And you mention the differences in, in the extract, and then even if the two populations are mixed together, they cannot reproduce um, fertile offsprings, and now there are new species are formed, and you specifically mention those um, species. So in last year paper, let us see this one, and now we will apply speciation on it. The present day distribution of three closely related species of the dog family, um, the Quixote, Jackal and the Dingo is shown in the world map below. Okay, now we will start in a population of a single species of dog family. Now you refer and you use the example in the um, A. They become separated by geographical barrier in this case, it's continental drift or ocean specific. And they are now split into how many groups? One, two, three. They are split into three groups, three different populations. And then we will say there are no gene flow between the three populations. And the three populations um, 
undergo natural selection independently and they could not uh, mix, or even if they are mixed together, they cannot produce fertile offspring. So now there are three different species and you refer to the different species as coyote, jackal and dingo. But the opening statement if, is if a population of a single species, the original population, eh, the original population of the dog family was separated by a geographical barrier, you name the geographical barrier. And for those three sentences, you will receive one mark. So it must be stated correctly. That is in speciation very, very important. Right. The last thing that I want to um, emphasize on is um, humans versus the African apes, similarities and differences. Look at the similarities and differences. But also, in the differences, look at what is the significance of bipedalism, the large brain, the C-shaped spine, the pelvic girdle, which now is short and wide. So in bipedalism, he can walk upright, he can see um, further, he can um, spot predators, hands are free to use tools or to protect or whatever. The larger brain with the skull that large, enlarge, the brain also enlarge, so more information can be interpreted, more coordination, speak, and um, you can use your hands or hand coordination is better. Your C-shaped spine that is going to an S-shaped spine is for balance and um, to distribute um, weight even. So when you are standing up that you can do that. And also the significance of the pelvic griddle. So that not only the similarities and differences, but also what is the significance, what changes um, in, in African apes and humans that make it more significant. Also the teeth, um, no more canines or no more, um, they don't use it, they are not large anymore and they use it now, no more using it for killing pro, um, 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 prey or predation and predators. Um, they are using it now for soft food so they don't need large and sharp canines anymore. Also, emphasize on the line of changing. How did the, what is the line of, of changing? So from Australopithecus, Homo habilis, and Homo sapiens, how did the change occur? And from, from um, the shift of the foramen machten to a more forward position, less protruding jaws, and all those futures that change the line. And then the last one that I want to emphasize, remember now the evidence of human evolution, we have three evolutions. Evidence of evolution, which is fossils, biogeography, um, modification by descent, your homologous structures, genetics. Evidence of human evolution includes all your fossil records, cultural evidence and genetic evidence, which is your um, mitochondrial DNA. And then evidence of out of Africa hypothesis is only fossil records and genetic evidence. And you must be able to explain it if they ask. Um, explain um, evidence, name, and explain the evidence that we have on human evolution. So from my side, that is what I have for you on, on tips, exam tips. I hope um, maybe some of the things that are highlighted, um, especially on, on the way you answer it. Sometimes you know what to answer, but just the way you express yourself and the way you answer it, um, there's not enough evidence. Remember, life science is a science, and the science is a specific process um, that must be followed. And when you are describing protein synthesis, um, DNA profiling, um, genetics it's, uh, it's a process that must be explained in the scientific way. So from my side, good luck for Monday. Um, good luck for the preparations. 
um, hang in there, guys, and um, good luck to each and every teacher that is still um, helping out there this weekend. Um, the learners, good luck to you all. Best of luck. Thank you. Oh, then I must remind you there will be a competition. MTN is hosting a competition. The prize for this question um, on this is a bucket hat and a t-shirt, something that we can use on your um, trick vacation. Um, it will become come in handy. And uh, you go to FE's Department of Education Facebook and you can get the question there and you answer also there. And the question that uh, I'm going to ask you, I, I even repeat it twice in the presentation. Um, so my question today is, what do we call the arrangement of all your genes on all your chromosomes? The arrangement of all the genes on all your chromosomes. Um, and you can go to Facebook and you can um, enter, submit your answer for a bucket hat and a t-shirt. Thank you very much.